Radiative transfer in aquatic environments can often be a little bit more complicated than those in terrestrial environments. So we've got an example here of looking at our initial source of energy with the sun and as with terrestrial environments we still have interactions in the atmosphere. But then once, it's hit, once the light hits a water body we have a number of additional levels that we need to look at. So at the surface of the water we have the air water interface which can cause refraction of light. And the amount of light that also penetrates into the water body will be a function of the, the surface roughness, so whether it's, a, whether it's a calm day or whether there's a lot of um, individual small waves which will reflect and absor absorb light differently as well. It also depends on, in the water column itself, what the, in, in addition to water, what other materials do you, are there. So are there a lot of suspended sediments or, um, or nutrients in that water body and how that affects the absorption and reflection of light as well. And then once we pass through the water, we also have substrate features. So are we looking at, at sediment, rock, coral, seagrass, etc.? So the, in the actual water column itself, we've got a lot of absorption and scattering, and this is really controlled by suspended and dissolved matter. But the key controls within the whole water body itself are the surface roughness and how that affects the specular reflection of light, any organic and inorganic matter, the water depth, and also substrate type. So these all intermingle together to, to produce a, sing, a signal back at the sensor. If we look at the effects of, of water depth to start with, you can have a look at the graph on the left hand side. We've got wavelength on the x-axis and the red graph is showing us the amount of absorption of light at different wavelengths. So you can see that as, as you increase the wavelength you also increase the amount, the absorption of light. But you also can see that as you, as you increase the wavelength you would decrease the scattering of light. In the image at the top right hand corner there we've got an image of Heron Reef. So most of the, most of the reef is actually underwater. And if you have a look in the, the grayscale image of the blue band, you can still see quite a lot of information across the reef. And that's just meaning that blue light is able to penetrate through most of those wavelengths. If you then have a look at red light, for example, there's a large area of this lagoon which you can no longer get information from. And as a rule of thumb, the near-infrared near -infrared light will penetrate through the upper couple of centimetres of the water column. Red light will get through about 3 to 5 metres, green light around about 10, and blue light up to 20 metres. That's in clear water. Okay, so by, by seeing this particular image where the, the lagoon there um, you're no longer getting much of a return from the red band. That indicates to me that that's probably about five meters deep. And you have a look at the near infrared band, and you lose all information from the reef there, with the exception of the island, which is vegetated, so obviously has a really high reflectance of near infrared light, and the white edge around the reef here, which are the breaking waves, and they're reflecting all light, um, regardless of the wavelength. So as we looked at, at Liberty for vegetation spectral signature simulation, there are also programs to look at water bodies as well. So this is just an example that you can have a look at, um, which will allow you to change the amount of dissolved um, organic and inorganic matter in the water column and have a look at what that does to a spectral signature. You can also change the depth, for example. And all this leads us to be able to create quantifiable biophysical maps based on satellite imagery. So this is an example from a SeaWIFS image. Each pixel is one kilometer, um, one kilometer by one kilometer, and the image contains eight spectral bands. Now, using what we know about the absorption of chlorophyll in, spe in specific wave bands, we can come up with a relationship. And in this case, we're looking at a relationship between um, chlorophyll A and the reflectance in bands 3 and 5. And we can use this to then create an image of the entire Earth showing us the chlorophyll A concentration in terms of milligrams per metre cubed. And if we look a little bit closer, we can really see, quantify 
in individual pixels how much chlorophyll is actually there. We can get the same sort of information out of coral as well. So again, understanding the relationships between the reflection and absorption of light in specific wavelengths and what that means in terms of pigmentation. For minerals and soils, it's the same sort of process. Minerals in particular have really specific absorption spectra and in particular in the shortwave infrared region. And this has led to a really big development of minerals exploration using remote sensing, particularly with hyperspectral data. And it's also really useful because minerals vary less than vegetation, for example. So there's, there are not so many variables in determining or in, in being able to identify individual minerals within a soil or within a rock type. So also with soils, the main control on their reflection and absorption of light is first of all the mineral content, any organic content within the soil, the surface roughness and texture, and moisture content 